Welcome to Academy Dialogues. It starts with us. My name is Sean Finney. We are continuing our ongoing series of conversations about race, ethnicity, history, opportunity, and the art of filmmaking. Today's discussion group will explore the invisibility of Latinos in Hollywood, the complexity of Latin identity, legacies of colonialism, and solutions to advance representation. Moderating today's conversation is Lorenzo Munoz, EVP, Member Relations and Awards at the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. Victoria Alonzo, EVP Production, Marvel Studios. Casting Director, Producer, Carmen Guba. Director, Nadia Halgren. Actress, Producer, Director, and Businesswoman, Eva Longoria. And Marketing Strategist, Yvette Rodriguez. We look forward to your conversation today. Hello, everybody. Welcome, Mujeres. It's so wonderful to have you all here. It's it's such a dream for me to be able to host this conversation that is absolutely necessary and I think we're all going to really enjoy and commune over. So uh, without much further ado, let's, let's get started. Uh, so tell us, what brought you to Hollywood? What was your story? And what have you faced along the way? Let's start with Eva. Of course, you start with me as my son is marching through. <laughs> through the room. Mama loves you. Um, so yeah, you know, my gosh, my journey has been a long one. I, uh, I never wanted to be an actor. I didn't even know about the industry. I grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, and we had a TV. We didn't even go to the movies because it was just too expensive. We would go to the dollar cinemas, which were the movies that were out already for a very long time. <laughs> um, so that was as close as I got to experience in Hollywood. But I don't know what happened. I went to college and one day I said, I'm going to be an actor. <laughs> and I told my mom, I said, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become an actor and moved to LA with $200 in my bank account and went and got a job and just figured it out. I figured it out. I think, um, uh, my journey to today, which is more directing and producing. Uh, people always think I'm an actor turned director producer, but I always tell people I was always a director producer who happened to fall into acting as a means to the end of becoming a director. Uh, but uh, for me, it's just been, it's been a fun journey because I remember arriving in Hollywood and not being Latina enough because I didn't speak Spanish and I didn't have an accent. And every audition I went on, they were like, uh, you know, uh, you know, could you do it more like Rosie Perez? <laughs> and I was like, well, I, um, I don't, I'm not from New York. I'm not Puerto Rican. Like that's a specific dialect. And then, uh, and I didn't speak Spanish, so I couldn't go out in Spanish language things either. So I wasn't Latin enough and then I wasn't white enough. And, uh, and so I got Italian roles. <laughs> I was Eva Longoria. I was like, great, I'll take it. I will do that role um, for a long time. And, and what it made me realize in the industry was obviously stereotypes and what people think a Latina should sound like or look like, but also uh, that Hollywood thought we were monolithic, that there's not Afro-Latinas, that we're all of one um, sexuality, that we are all supposed to be gorgeous and, and sexy and uh, feisty. I remember I kept getting a note when I was on Young and the Rest of the Story, could you do it more Latina? And I'm like, I am Latina. Like, I, I can't do it any more Latina because I am Latina. And so um, there was a big learning curve for our industry. And I think that today, people always go, how are we doing today? And I said, you know, we're facing the right direction now. I don't know if we've taken enough steps in the right direction, but there's, well, at least we're facing the right direction and, and we're having these conversations, which is really important. That's wonderful. Yeah. And as you can see from our beautiful panel, how different we all are and we are all Latinas. It's wonderful, our diversity. Uh, Victoria Alonso. Yeah, Maud. Um, gosh, I don't know. I was never supposed to be in Hollywood. I, you know, I grew up in Argentina, born and raised. Uh, I'm a, a teenager of the military dictatorship where um, I always say that the theater saved my life. So, because instead of being in marches, I was at the theater uh, playing, rehearsing, and I was very involved in the marches. So um, I, I often have told the story of, I, I used to hold the banners uh, in the front row. I know that's a surprise. Uh, and because the banners were so heavy, we ended up, I ended up like staying back two or three rows and 
But when they shot, they shot at the first row and the second row. And by the time that the third row was about to be hit, we, we had a chance to run. So all that to say that um, when, I, when I wanted to study something, I studied theater and psychology because that's what my father was. And that was a chance for me to get close to him. And he died at the age of 40. So he died very young and I was very little. Um, when I came to the States, I had never thought that I would be in production. Uh, and I had in LA, I had three jobs and um, I worked at uh, Alaska Airlines at five in the morning, five to 12 for a long time. Um, and then I will go to Paramount Pictures to be a page. And I did all the live shows. And then uh, during the weekends, I would have a black Angus waitress job. This is with, I had a full college education already finished, but I was trying to figure out what I was doing. And I tell you the Alaska Airlines uh, story because I think it's important. A friend of mine at Alaska Airlines said, hey, I think you'd be great in production. I'm like, what is production? Because I was doing, uh, I was uh, helping produce a show called uh, Frida Kahlo at the Bilingual Foundation of the Arts. And um, she said, I have a friend that works in production. You should meet with her. So I got to meet with Carla and she gives me my first PA job. Um, that to say from there on, that was almost 30 years ago. Um, but when we did Captain Marvel, I worked at Alaska Airlines and I didn't, I didn't want to ask my mother for money. Um, so I had the three jobs and I had jobs that gave me food. Alaska Airlines gave me the leftover, uh, food from first class because they threw it away. I ate it daily and I took it home. Um, then I would go to the shows, the live shows at Paramount. They fed all of us. That was beautiful. I ate at night. And on the weekends, I'm Argentinian, no denying there, uh, I ate steak at Black Angus <laughs> for a reduced price. Um, when we did Captain Marvel, Alaska Airlines had um, a couple of planes with Captain Marvel on it. And I remember being in a marketing uh, meeting and I saw it and I just that I said nothing. I was just, my tears were coming down. What full circle to those days. Look, I'm talking about a plane and here's the Santa Monica airport gives us the plane cue sound. I love it. This is a great time. I remember thinking if you would have written it, there's, they would have said, no, that's a little too much. You know, that you go from, <laughs> that you go from eating the food and working uh, at Alaska Airlines to having the, their plane, having our film, that was one of the pinnacles alongside with Black Panther. I always say this, pinnacles of my career. So from production, from PA to now alongside with Lou and Kevin heading the studio, I'm on my 30th Marvel film and my eight is an eighth streaming show and second animation show so we anyway long story to tell you all that amazing trajectory and game changing what you've done um nadia hallgren tell us about your journey wow so my journey i still don't feel hollywood um i feel like documentary uh i never imagined uh being a documentary documentary filmmaker would land me somehow anywhere near hollywood I'm born and raised in the South Bronx, and I started being interested in documentary through a community photography program that my mom encouraged me to go to at the International Center of Photography. And it just really kind of stirred up this interest in the storytelling and gave me an opportunity to try and make sense of the world that I lived in. Um, and then, you know, I started making short films and through, you know, the biggest stroke of luck in my life, I met um, one of Michael Moore's producers at a community uh, film festival in the Bronx. And she gave me, her name's Tia Lesson, she gave me my very first job as a PA as well, which is, I always think those are great stories, working on Fahrenheit 9-11. And um, at that point, I decided that I wanted to be a cinematographer. I felt like being a, DP gave me an opportunity to not have to speak. I could show up on set, I could be quiet and not have to sort of expose my, what I thought was like my lack of education or that I kind of came, you know, from the hood. Um, 
before I worked in film, I was a nightclub bouncer. Um, and uh, I worked, you know, worked my way up, started working as a DP, and then ultimately started directing um, documentaries. And that's how I'm here. Awesome. I love that you were a bouncer. <laughs> that's so cool. You know me, so you can probably now imagine that that. I'm sure there's a thousand stories that we can hear from yes, you. Yes, so we could just do the whole thing on that. Oh my God. Listen, that's a, that's a good documentary too, Nadia. It is. <laughs> I love it. Um, Carmen, Cuba, tell us your story. Um, yeah, well, like most of us so far, this was not my plan. Um, my father is Peruvian and was a political economist for the, the UN growing up and my mom is American of Dutch and Italian descent and was a Spanish teacher who started um, her sort of connection to Latin America at 15 when she was an exchange student. She was a, she had skipped various grades and she was an exchange student in college in Colombia. So my two parents met both being fluent speaker, well, my father was not a fluent American, uh, uh, English speaker, but my mother spoke Spanish fluently and they met in college and um, had me and I lived between Peru and Bolivia. Very, very immersed, Peru, Bolivia and um, eventually New Mexico, but I was very immersed in a world with, that was surrounded by people from all over the world from birth. Um, many of my parents, colleagues were, you know, from all over the world. I went to an international school in Bolivia. So my first friends were African and anyway, that's just to say that it, the sort the stage was set for me to explore and be very interested in humans um, from all different backgrounds from myself and have, you know, I come from a great respect for that, that idea of authentic diversity in the lives that we actually live. And um, when I moved to the States, I moved to, in, when I was around 11, I moved to New Mexico, which is another very complicated ethnic sort of mix. And there my mom got me involved in, um, like Nadia, your mom, my mom got me involved in a, in a bilingual theater group. And it was one of only three in the country at the time. And it was run by a, an openly gay Puerto Rican, HIV positive man. And so that was sort of my, and he was in New Mexico trying to tell these stories um, with non-professional actors. He was trying to start a, a real community um, theater company. Um, a lot of it focusing on who are, who are New Mexicans and who are we? So in that I ran lights, I did sound, I you know was on stage, I, I was one of only two kids because it was all, it was really adults. So I came up through that, all the while thinking I needed to have, you know, a real job <laughs> when I grew up. So I went into journalism and I studied journalism. And then from there, I was a news reporter on Univision, back when there were only three channels in New Mexico and only one of them was Spanish speaking. So I did that and then I came to, to but actually, when I was doing that, I realized that I love people and I love stories and doing news. You only got, you know, sort of this accident happened. Here's the person who, what, where, when, why. And I always wanted to follow those people home and a month later and be like, so how did it affect you? <laughs> um, and so I, I really always have really connected to these human stories. So I came to L.A. because a boyfriend that I had in college lived here. And um, and I pursued document. I thought I was gonna pursue documentary film. And one thing led uh, someone like Victoria. It's like someone suggested I meet someone, and suddenly I was in post production on the second season of The Real World, which was shooting in Los Angeles. Which at the time was a it was a true documentary. It wasn't reality TV. It was really about the people. And anyway, so then I, I sort of worked my way through that and they suggested I try casting since I was in, a journalist and they didn't, no one knew what casting was back then of that. So I did that for a while and loved it. And I 
you know, even back then, I had a, they did a spinoff show called Road Rules, and it was about this group of kids traveling across America. And to me, because at that, I also lived on a Navajo reservation um, for one of the years that I was, after I moved to New Mexico. And uh, so I put the first Native American person on MTV in the 90s. And to me, that was just made total sense because it was, you know, the first show of ki kids traveling across America. Um, so anyway, I, it's always been part of my, my life. And from there, when things became reality TV, somebody suggested that I try narrative and I said yes. And that's how I am here today. Wonderful. Wow. That's amazing. I was an exchange student too. Oh, wow. In San Diego. And, you oh. know, I showed up and all, you know, I come from the, the dictatorship, right? Uniforms, you can't do all yeah. these things. And here are all these girls and boys in their swimming suits and flip flops. And they didn't have a lot of clothes in school. And I, I was appalled. I was like, they're going to come and get him. This is not going to go well. And it took me like three months to get it that they were not in trouble. Um, anyway. We digress. It's it's funny how all of our cultural, you know, stuff that comes with us, right? Like I'm from Mexico, and when I came here in the summer when I was six years old, and in Mexico a lot of people go, tss, 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 tss. oh yeah, oh yeah, tss, tss. right? And and the the camp counselor looked at me and she was like, in America we don't do that. I'm not a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first foray into, oh, okay. This is what I do um, now in Mexico for yes. Yeah. So <laughs> if, you're, if somebody says something, you go. And so I do this in meetings now and people go, do you have a question? Eva? <laughs> and I go, no, no, I'm, a, I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> Why? Oh, and Yvette, Yvette Rodriguez, tell us your story. My story. Hi. Um, well, I was born in Puerto Rico and I moved to New Jersey to a small town in New Jersey, 45 minutes from the city with my parents, actually on American Airlines with all the Rodriguez's. We all moved to this little small town and, um, and, and I was raised, it was very much a working class town and I was, I, I grew up with Polish people and I, Italian, African American, like everybody worked for Johnson and Johnson or Ford. So we all owned homes and the American dream, right? That's what I grew up in and then cut to, but you know, definitely no understanding that there was an industry. Like I didn't understand there was a film industry or a record industry. You like the best thing you can think of is, you know, you're going to become a doctor or a lawyer or this, this was, you know, what you aspire to do. And I was in New York City going to school and working as a paralegal at a law firm when my, Nate, when my roommate came home and told me that she had just gone for a job interview at Arista Records and she was appalled because they weren't there. I don't even remember what the amount was, but it was not a high paying job and she had already graduated college. So then I decided that I would go, that I would like the opportunity to experience a job interview. And I went for a job interview at 6 West 57th Street. And when I got off on the seventh floor, I saw all these gold and platinum records on the wall. And I was like, oh my God, where am I? I had no idea growing up, loving film, loving music, but not, not being sophisticated enough to know that there was an industry. So at that point I met with my, who became my mentor, I interviewed with her. And at the end of the interview, I extended my hand to her and I said, thank you for your time. I can start Monday. And she said, okay, we'll see you then. And that was the beginning of my career at Arista Records, Clive Davis. Um, you know, first artist was Whitney Houston. Um, but you know, immediately I noticed that I was, I didn't know I was different actually until I started working. And because people wanted my opinion about things that I didn't understand why, because I was a Jersey girl, rock and roll girl, like why? And it was because of the color of my skin, I quickly understood. And so, Cut to Orion Pictures, which is why this is really full circle. They just announced what they announced. But Orion Pictures was nearby, and I could see the posters on the wall. When you walk, I would walk for lunch, and I would look up, and those were movie posters. I was like, oh, my God, what is this? And then we worked on the soundtrack for Dying Young, Julia Roberts. I was like, I'm a big fan of Julia Roberts, and we get to work on the soundtrack because Kenny G um, did the main theme song. And... 
I went to my first screening, right, to meet with the publicity department from the studio. And I was like, oh my God, what is this, right? And so I moved west. I moved west to get into the film industry. And um, I started and I was in the, in the, rec in the, in the studio and uh, quickly understood that I was different. Um, just being in meetings, really being the only brown person. I'm aging myself, but this is a really long time ago. We've come a long way, but nowhere near where we need to be. But I remember like a feeling when um, the studio executive, the head of a studio came to me to excited to let me know that he now understood my culture because he just got done seeing a film about a Puerto Rican in the South, in like a poverty stricken Puerto Rican in the South Bronx. And, I was, and he says, I really understand your culture now. And this is a true story. I was like, oh, okay. I mean, it was just like, I didn't even say anything. And people that know me will say, I don't believe you didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. <laughs> I, I found my voice later in life. I was just shocked, but that's happened a lot to me. And um, so I think I, I was always a little activist at heart. And um, actually my experience, th both of these experiences in records and in film actually propelled my career. So I started my own company in 1997, specifically called it American Entertainment Marketing because I was like, hello, we are American. And, um, and so it was just to like authentically con you know, connect with the Latino consumer. And um, so it's interesting that Hollywood has pushed, or this industry has pushed me um, to start my own company and now pushed me to want to produce my own films. So, you know, this is a, that's my story. I hope, it, is that my full story? <laughs> so what movie did you see that dude? Ooh, you're going to ask me that? Now we're going to know who it is? <laughs> Which one? Okay. Okay. I bet we can guess if she tells us the year, because there was, was one it, movie okay. every five years. Maybe, it was a Puerto right? Rican movie. Was it West Side Story? No. Was it I Selena? like it like no, that. Selena, it was, Selena was Mexican American yeah. from no, Texas. No, I like it like that. Uh, oh, I no. like it like that. <laughs> Sorry, give charades. <laughs> Well, that leads us to the next question, which is about stereotypes, right? And how uh, I think Eva also touched on this as well is this just this general perception of us that's either you're feisty, you're angry, you're fiery, what a temper, you're so sexy, you're so hot, you're so you're the maid, you're the chola, you're the like there are all of these stereotypes that we all have all had to deal with. Um, tell us some of your stories and we, we can start with Nadia. Wow. Um, I think for me, especially, you know, I, I came up and I still am just behind the camera. I'm, a, you know, as a cinematographer and someone on like the technical side, I, I think the main experience that I had that was always a little bit crushing was you know, the minute I walked in the room, people had no idea what I was doing there. You know, it would be typically uh, a crew looked like a room full of white men. Um, and when I walked in, you know, it was like, what, what are you doing here? And it was this like up and down look, a lot at my hair. You know, I would try to even consider if that day I was going to work, if it was very humid out, you know, how I can like not bring so much attention to myself. But you know, that, that was something very uh, common that happened. And even though it's a look, it's just this feeling that then sits with you an entire day of work. Um, and I think, you know, something that surprised, I, I guess surprised me and it shouldn't have was I thought as I moved up in, you know, experience and credits that um, I would get treated differently. But the, um, the amount of times that I'm just, completely underestimated in my job and my ability at times is, um, <clears throat> you know, I think it, it just speaks to systemically this stereotype that is, you know, rampant in all industries, but just, you know, about where we come from, our in intellect, you know, our abilities. And I think that that's just, that's definitely um, probably one of the, the things that have I've had to work within myself and within the people that I collaborate with the most to try and create an environment that, you know, 
makes it possible to show up to work every day and 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 be happy and uh, satisfied with with the process you know yes it's so funny because i think that is something uh we have the double whammy because we're women and we're people of color and dimming our light when we go on a set, especially as a director. I, I remember I had a guy tell me after I, we finished directing an episode of something, he goes, you know, you're, you're good. And I was like, <laughs> what a jerk. <laughs> Thank you. As if he expected- You weren't. Yeah, he expected me not to be good. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that dimming your light and, and like, I just don't, I wanna be small and not, no, not have anybody noticed me and I, I was directing while well, breastfeeding I had just had my baby and I said oh my god I don't want the guys the 90% of the crew to feel I didn't want them to feel uncomfortable that's mm -hmm. I was worried about them feeling as I was like I'm gonna have to take breaks to breath to pump and then to breastfeed and da, 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 da. and it's like dimming our light for that for who why like be good be uh, be your best and let everybody deal with it but I've oh yeah I, I felt that way too Nadia you know, you're like, oh, should I wear my hair different? I'm always thinking about what to wear to set because I want to be comfortable, but I don't want to look like a slob. And then I'm a girl, but I don't want to be girly. And it's like, it's so much you have to navigate because you want to be seen as a boss, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's too much to think about before you're even like doing the work, right? Like that's not hard enough. <laughs> It's like we don't even know what they feel because they've never had to have that little chapter of the book, um, which we do. I, I often, I, I, to, I don't know that I've been discriminated. I am pretty loud and feisty and I, I tend to uh, advocate to the, to the good stereotypes of who we are as passionate women. But I, um, I tell the story, like I would say halfway into our successful career at Marvel, came this man that came to pitch as a director. <clears throat> I've told the story before, it's the story of the coffee. And um, when you're about to be interviewed at Marvel, if you're the, one of the two people that were trying to decide who is who, that you get to meet Luke, Kevin and myself. And usually there's the, creative, the other creative producer, there's four of us that will walk it through. And you've met with the other person, but you haven't met the three of us. We were running so late for this meeting and, and the, the other, the fourth producer had gone already to say, I'm sorry, they're running late. I'm sorry, the guys, because we're always the guys and I'm, I'm a part of that and I'm okay with it. The guys are running behind the rest. So finally, I leave the meeting that I'm with Kevin and Lou and I said, you know what? One of us needs to show the face. We were like way behind. I go, I'll go and I'll tell him. When I get there and, uh, and I said, gosh, I am so sorry, We're running really behind. Can, have they even asked you, do you want anything? Can I get you anything to drink? Or I want coffee, I want coffee with milk and I want it now. I said, oh, and I thought, wow, you are nervous. And I'm thinking, okay, well, let's walk over, uh, over here. There, there was a conference room was here and there was a little coffee area there. And, uh, but a true, true jerk. And so I'm making the coffee and I'm thinking, cause you know, I'm Argentinian. So I battle my ego all day. You're making the coffee? You're making the coffee? Oh, wait, 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 I'm not done Longoria. Para, para. So I go in, I make the coffee and I put an equal and I don't put milk. He wanted sugar and milk. And he goes, God damn it. I told you, I did not want, and I said, no, 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 I, I heard what you wanted. This is my coffee. Now, I walked you through how the coffee machine works. You saw me do it. I'm sure you were quick to learn. I will be right back with the guys. So enjoy your coffee. And I walked out and that was that moment where you can let the ego be alive and well. I could have said all kinds of things. I could have said, all kinds of things. Cause to be honest with you, they were in my head. They were all, they were tight. And I was like, shh, guys, shh, shh. And I thought, you know what? I won't forget this moment. I'm sure he won't forget this moment. And so I walked away, three of us came in and he was purple, purple. When I walked in, he was like, oh my God. Now needless to say, he pitched. It wasn't a good pitch and he didn't get the job, which is always what they asked me. Did he get the job? But it had nothing to do with the fact that he was a jerk. The pitch was not a good pitch. 
Uh, but even at that moment in time where we had made $10 billion worth of successful films, we had had the first Avenger movies out. We've had many movies. I mean, like, I don't know. I think we were in movie number we're in movie 30 now, which is a different kind of success. But at that moment in time, in a movie, whatever, 10 that we were, or eight, we had the, the kind of success that people talk about, right? Because if you have one movie that makes a lot of money, people talk about it. Uh, but even at that moment in time, the assumption was that I was the girl, that I would have taken notes or I would have made him coffee. Armin, tell us your stories. Well, it's interesting listening to that, all of that, because I think because I have Peruvian and American in my, you know, family and my in my experience, I sort of grew up, uh, you know, my my mother's family is from Queens um, and my grandfather, who I was very close to, is a NYPD lieutenant. And uh, I'm sure, I, you know, the story is I was his favorite. And yet, when he was introducing me to people, he would say, this is my Puerto Rican granddaughter. And, but he didn't know the difference between Puerto Rico and Peru. At, you know, it's like in the 70s, early 70s. And, to, and my mom, his daughter, was so mortified and mad all the time. And I was like, it doesn't matter to me. Like, I love him. He loves me. It's fine. So I think growing up feeling like, oh, people just don't know, um, sort of set the stage for me because I don't, I don't really notice it in a way because I've been able to be successful despite whatever has maybe been, whatever bias has come my way. And also I have the, Lorenzo, we talked about this a little, I have the, the privilege of sort of ethnic ambiguity which is a thing too, you know, it's like people, they mostly think I'm Asian. So that experience is, I don't know what people think, but I know that they don't know what I actually am most of the time until they ask. And so I do think I've had privilege in that, that way. And I think like all of us, we have these different privileges as well as these biases against us where if you're tall, if you look a certain way, if you, you know, so um, I would say that my ethnic ambiguity has actually given me a lot of permission to do the, make a lot of moves in, inside the dominant culture of Hollywood and in, inside the mainstream movies that I've worked on because I can sort of suggest something that someone else would not have suggested. And I, pr I have actually gotten mostly very positive response. Like when I say, oh, that you know, in Bowfinger, shouldn't that shopkeeper, couldn't that shopkeeper be Asian? And, and, the, and then I present them John Cho and they go, oh yeah. But if I wasn't there and I hadn't presented that, it would have been white because that's just the default. And certainly back then, it's much better now. But um, anyway, I don't know if that answers the question. No, it's so funny because I had that privilege too, because I didn't have an accent. People assumed I actually, uh, many times that I was white. And so yeah. they would be like, Latino, that Latino. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm one of them. <laughs> like, don't forget. And they would forget. Uh, you know, it's, for me, I have, uh, to talk about stereotypes specifically, because I'm the same, I feel like we all have the same experience. And like, have I been discriminated against because of my ethnicity? I think we've all experienced a lot of sexism. Um, and I've sp spoken to a lot of women of color and they always go what's what's the cross you bear and they always go, oh definitely because i'm a woman not so much because i'm a latina woman but a woman um but stereotypes in the media so like if you're talking about storytelling the danger there's two sides of the coin and i have two opinions about it because i produced a um i produced a show called devious maids i produced and directed it and the the backlash because I was Latina doing a, a, a show about maids, um, you know, it was like, wow, why are you stereotyping us again, whatever. And in, if you saw the show, the maids were the moral compass of the story. And the employers were the assholes and the idiots. We were making a point about how you treat domestic workers. And, and I also took offense that you think those people don't have stories to tell, gardeners, domestic workers, nannies, maids, you're saying their lives don't matter. 
So when you think about gangbangers or things in movies, we have to be careful how we tell the story, but if you give them life and reason and make them the, the point of view in which we are telling the story, then that's a different thing. If you're using them frivolously in a movie as a caricature of what people think they should be, then that's offensive. But, but in storytelling, I think it's important to make sure that we do tell those stories. You know, if you saw Damien Bichir in um, A Better Life, Better Life, your heart rips out of your body because he was a, 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 a father trying to protect his son. And if we humanize this, the, the people of our community and we give them stories and lives that are worth telling, then people will maybe see them as human instead of other and instead of from there and instead of go back to where you came from. Um, I thought, you know, once this children in cages on the border happened, I thought, oh, mom's everywhere. We're going to get so much support because any mother knows how that feels. And we didn't. And you know why? Because we haven't shown that these people at the border crossing with their children are moms. We have to humanize these people. And so sometimes with, when you talk about stereotypes, when I think about it in the narrative storytelling way, we ha I think we have to tell those stories. We can't shy away and not tell them. That's such a great point, Eva. And, and I think it leads us into the next, next question about our invisibility too as a community and the data that has been um, compiled, uh, particularly by Stacey Smith at USC, that um, in front of the camera, behind the camera, we're just missing. We're 18% of the population in this country, and yet we are in the low 4%, 3% uh, in terms of it, just in front of the camera. So uh, everybody, jump in, please. Eva, I'm sure you have a perspective on this as well. <laughs> I have a very strong perspective on this because I think, uh, and I'll be quick, but um, no matter what part of the film ecosystem we're talking about, uh, Latinos are vastly underrepresented. Writer, director, producer, actor, casting director, stunt coordinator, crew members, first ACs, camera operator, every part of the pipeline, you do not see uh, Latinos. And, it, and this is at a time where Latinos in our country are facing intense concern about our safety. You know, that we, we are being attacked daily uh, in our communities. And so to have authentic and accurate representation throughout entertainment is important. And, and the interesting thing about Stacey Smith's study is she didn't call it underrepresentation of Latinos in, in Hollywood. She called it the erasure of Latino community, the erasure, because what happens is that void that um, is happening in the entertainment industry is being filled by hateful, violent rhetoric through news. And so uh, it's imperative that, you know, talented storytellers from our community are given opportunities to tell diverse and vibrant narratives because um, it actually boils down to the safety, uh, our safety in this country. I'd also like to make a point here um, as, as it relates to invisibility, because really, um, where it all begins is that we are absent from our history books. So K through 12, there is absolutely, um, we're, we're not educating our own children, nor are we educating other children about our contribution. Then you go into higher learning, same thing. So we are, we are completely erased. And so Hollywood that has such an incredible opportunity to it, it actually shapes perception, right? they're erasing us completely. So therefore that's why you can, you know, people to Eva's point, like there are babies, brown babies in cages and people can walk with and just sleep at night with no problem. So the problem is, is it's a really large problem, especially when you look at not only 18% of the population, our purchasing power, the fact that this economy does not work without, Amer without American Latinos, it just doesn't. So like if you, and also if you look at our population, first of all, globe population, right? Let's look at the numbers. Like what percentage of people in the world are white versus the rest of us? Like it's just, common sense numbers, it's business, it's catching up with Hollywood. So at this point, it's like, you gotta start from the very top, like the board of directors, the CEOs, cause it's all about money, right? It's obviously also about, about healing 
right? Like to be able to see us as human, there are 60 million plus stories in this country alone that you're missing out on. And you just keep perpetuating the same story over and over again. And so, um, and I think that growing up on, in this environment, you know, I learned to code switch in a very early age and I didn't even truly understand it until like the last decade. Like really understand that I sort of was proud that I could sit in a room with a bunch of white people and fit in because I spoke English in a certain way. And it wasn't until I realized like how much that really has affected me. I am Puerto Rican. In my blood is African ancestry. It is you know, European ancestry and indigenous. And I am the colonized and the colonizer. And, um, and so I think that we're now sort of like coming together as Latinos from all walks of life, whether you're Mexican, Puerto Rican, wherever it is. And I feel like we're, we're coming together more now and we're really truly not gonna ask for permission anymore and we're working together. I'm seeing that, like I'm seeing a movement in that way. It's also that people always think that Latinos are the dark skinned people. I am as Latina as they come but I never get involved. I never get included. Well, you're white, aren't you? No, I'm not. I'm not. Well, Argentinians are kind of white. I'm like, <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, that's the other side of the court. Yeah, we tan well, as you can see. I mean, we've, I've been out of my yard for a long time now. It's 187 days, but hey, it was counting. Um, but we are, you know, I'm sure, Carmen, you probably suffer some of that, although you you do have American uh, heritage, but mine is Italian and Spaniard. And where do we fit in? Is it, I mean, if I don't say my last name, people think I'm from Holland. Don't ask me why, but I've been, I've, I've been asked if I'm Dutch more times than Greek or Italian or Spanish. I mean, like, I don't know. So it's within, even within our community, I'm not just saying white America, I'm telling you Latinos in America, we don't even know how vast our palette of shades and colors we are. And we tend to sort of exclude one another um, by doing that, unless somebody sees your last name or hears an accent. I mean, I tick every box, right? I, I, I was, came here very young as an exchange student. I was 15 and then at 19, I moved. I didn't speak English when I was little. So English is my second language, always has been and always will be. Um, female, you can't deny it, it's what it is, although I've been treated as one of the guys my entire life. I was always the only female in the room until I was able to make, be a part of a, a group of people that make the change so that you no longer are, because I also don't understand that part of it. There's a lot of women that love to be the only ones, and I'd love to have those women come and chat with us. <laughs> Please, Lorencita, <laughs> invite them. <laughs> okay, we'll find them. They're That's easy not, to find. <laughs> that is not the kind of shining star that you should that you should have as a badge of honor. Uh, but the, the, and I'm gay, so that psh, take another one. And um, I, I have an adopted child. Psh, take another. I mean, like you name it, bring it on. I'm over fifty, so I'm a senior. <laughs> <laughs> don't you mess with me girls i'm a senior so more respect uh, um, so i mean like it's one after the other but within our community we tend to discriminate our own as well yeah you know what i mean because well, i think i think that may have to do a little with our post-colonial legacy too right uh, of course. class and race and all of the baggage that we carry from the colonization I think the class conversation is a big one with regard to why are we not seen in Hollywood? Because who is making even, you know, who is making content and and what is how do you who is deciding what's important versus what's, you know, whatever the opposite of important is, you know, their films have to have been important. And that's very interesting when the group that, you know, is making that decision is primarily not of color or not upper middle class or not, you know, all of those things. I think it's very important to consider all of that. And I think, fortunately, that's been happening. It's been being considered. The Academy letting all these people in in the last few years has been 
a great step toward that. But still, you know, there's language. I, I, I always think about that, the important. How are we deciding? Who's deciding? Yeah. Um, I, I want to I wanna make sure that um, I pick on your phrase, the academy letting people. Oh my God, I was going to say the same thing. The academy thing. is inviting people right. that deserve to be in. They're not letting them in. Yes. To say that we're right. letting them in is saying that they have no place on earth being up here. It goes with my feisty. You invited me. Here I am. Um, <laughs> we belong we have a place in your table. The Academy is now taking a look at who are the guests for that dinner table, and we are invited to join. In fact, they can decline the invite, by the way. They don't have to be, uh, they have to say yes. But I think that is so important, and part of this, not only the patriarchy, but in just this, um, and how we attack this inclusivity and equality that we change how we talk about our people allowing us to come in you don't get to allow me mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, well and, and that's the thing it's not charity it's equality and there were many qualified people over the years who are not invited and uh and so i was just going to say the same thing it's not like you know oh thank you so much for letting me in because i did not feel that way it felt like you know we have so many people of talented caliber in our community that just don't recognize the same thing with the, with the um, drama with American dirt. When the author of that Oprah book club said, I wish somebody browner than me wrote the book about immigration and everybody in the publishing industry. I mean, every author goes, it has been written. Oprah mm -hmm. didn't pick them. Yep. Enrique so-and-so and, 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 and Raquel. Like this book has been written 18 times by a person of color. That, that book was not picked by the publishing industry. Your book was picked. And so, you know, that's what happens when you don't have a Victoria uh, 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 that has a seat at the table, when you don't have a Lorenza who has a seat at the table in these very uh, uh, huge institutions that we feel sometimes are impenetrable. So it's so important that you guys are there. It's and Carmen, I was very you. Uh, oh, no, no, I, that... that not at all. I don't know that, you know, this is not me and you, but no. that it's the words matter. Words. Oh, absolutely. Word. No, I, I completely get that. And actually, it's like I, I'm it's I appreciate that you pointed that out because it also speaks to like maybe how did I feel when I get got invited? Right. Like it's 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 a way to explore your own connection to it. But also, you know, for me, I really words do matter. And, and for me, when we talk about inclusion, I always say, I always change it to correcting exclusion. So I'm I very, love that. yeah, because because it, it's, I don't want to be included. I want you to fix that you let me, that you left I me out. I love that. I'm going to use it. Can I use it? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, it. but that's real. Like, that's the thing about language. Language is so important with all of this, especially for us. Yeah. Sorry, we language, perspective, all and and you all have, you know, Carmen certainly has been fighting the good fight. Victoria, I don't need to tell you what a fighter that one is. And thank God she's been in the room with us. <laughs> and Yvette and Nadia as well. I mean, it's it's been a very interesting thing to observe at the Academy, how we broaden people's uh, perspectives, shall we say, I, in a I, nice way. <laughs> I wanted to just make a point also, it's um, the people in power, right? They have this European POV, POV, right? And they're surrounded by people who look like them, talk like them, think like them, and have the same background. And so that, that's, where, that's where we really need to like see change happen, right? Because we can keep talking about this, and I've been in those rooms and, as well, <laughs> Carmen. Yes, Eva. <laughs> and it's sort of <laughs> shocking. Um, our perspectives and our um, stories are being whole, are in a chokehold in the Hollywood ecosystem and structure. And so until we have, we are in that room, I'm afraid we're not going to see the change that we need to see. Nadia, you wanted to say something and we kept cutting you off. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I had an interesting experience um, even when you mentioned the backlash about um, your, your film. Um, when I, I made a documentary called After Maria, and for, for my whole life, I wanted to make something that could explore 
Puerto Rican identity in the U.S. and just the complexity of, of what that is to be a citizen in the United States, you know, not speak the language, you know, be called all types of names and, and all these things. And it's something that I, I always wanted to do. So when Hurricane Maria happened, um, I decided to make a film, you know, I knew I wanted to make a film around the story of families that were leaving the island and coming to New York to, um, you know, find a new life, not die on the island, all the things that were happening. And so I ended up telling the story. I made a documentary about three moms who met on the same floor in a FEMA hotel and the relationship that they built between them, um, trying to survive the bureaucracy of FEMA and the experience that they were having. And um, so the, the film, uh, you know, gets greenlit by Netflix and they, they, they take this movie. And so as they started to um, play the, the trailer of the film, there was all this excitement around this film, you know, cause we, we made it relatively quickly and, you know, uh, Puerto Rico was still in the news and people were just like, I can't wait to see this movie. This is gonna be like the tell all film of what happened in Puerto Rico, the expose. And it wasn't, it was a character story about three moms that became friends and helped raise each other's kids and survive this experience. But we had such a tremendous backlash on this film from the Puerto Rican community, mainly for a couple of reasons. One was people had these high hopes of seeing themselves, every version of themselves in this movie, right? So they, people felt it should have been this like epic eight part Netflix series about what happened in Hurricane Maria and it was not. Um, and so anyone that didn't feel like their story was represented was angry. Um, and then the film was made by women who I, fell in love with that reminded me of my own family members, my own mother. And there were issues around class. And some people felt that I portrayed low class Puerto Ricans in this film. And it was such an interesting experiment for me to have this experience where I made something that is so dignifying and heartfelt and beautiful and people had all these different interpretations of it. And then at the same time, I had so many people that said, I can't believe you told this story. This is so amazing. I see myself in this and I've never seen Puerto Ricans on screen with this level of complexity. And so um, what, it, what it showed me was that there's this a huge void in Hollywood and what we're seeing on television where everyone holds on to this idea that this one film, which was like, 38 minutes was going to tell everyone's story and the disappointment that existed when they didn't feel like their story was told and how much more we need to tell stories so that people can see themselves. But since our, all of our identities are so different, that's not going to happen with one film and for platforms and streamers and whomever to understand that there's also this desperate desire to see this from an audience and, you know, there's so much opportunity there that's not being given to filmmakers. Well, I that think is... you bring up such an important point because if you're the only movie, they're gonna tear it apart for all the reasons. When you're one of the many movies, right? Then you can always reference, well, it portrayed this well, but it didn't do it like X movie or that movie, but you're the only movie to do it. So you have nothing but to do it right. And it's impossible to do it right. That's why, uh, one of the things that Eva said when she started is like, I don't, I don't want to do this. When I, when I step on set, I want, I need to check this, 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 this. It's like, no, you have to direct. As long as you get your story right, who cares if you're wearing a jean shirt or a regular t-shirt or a low cut or a no cut or a, who, nobody, you know what I mean? That, that kind of pressure, it, it, it puts the spotlight on there is true racism within the Latin community. You know what I mean? That the higher class doesn't want to be portrayed as the lower class. The lower class doesn't always want to portray, be portrayed as the people that need things because a lot of them are trying not to need it. And I mean, like there's, it's constant, right? Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then my identity as, as a Puerto Rican was totally put into question, you know, like I'm yeah. a New Yorkan from the Bronx. I don't speak Spanish. Yeah. I'm an 
um, you know, I'm Afro Puerto Rican. I'm not light skinned Puerto Rican. So it, it's you know, like, <laughs> I'm like, this is insane. But it also was so cathartic at the same time that it, um, you know, I think once you get over the initial sort of processing, it's, it, it, I, it, I felt like I was really able to explore something deep within myself through my work that I had been wanting to do like my whole life, you know? Yeah, I think also yes. you know, what Stacy's report did also was offer um, solutions because I think sometimes big companies, big studios are paralyzed by this problem. They, and they mm -hmm. think cast, just cast, 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 cast. And you're like, no, no, no. It, it, we need change across casting, building a pipeline for Latino filmmakers, whether it's writers or producers or directors, um, urging urging studios to hire Latino talent for advertising um, and the trailers. And the, there's companies that do that that are Latino owned. Um, so so making sure we're inclusive in, in the entire ecosystem of the industry um, and, and in the industry sectors would really help uh, our it would it would go a long way, and I think sometimes we only focus on casting, right? Like, cast more, cast more, and you're like, no, no, no. There's so much more in the infrastructure of opportunity that has to be created for us. But it does right. go to the some Latin kids, young adults, don't know these doors exist exist except for on camera because that's all they see. They don't see what I do. They don't see what Yvette does or what Carmen or Nadia does. They only see about what you do, right? Or what you used to do. I know you're directing and then you, you've always produced, but we need to inform and educate our own. That's why, I mean, I know Yvette, you and I and Lorenzo, of course, we do a lot of things together, but this is why I encourage everyone to do the panels, go to the schools, go to conferences, show your faces, tell them it happened to me. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody. And I came from far away. And so that kids understand, oh, I could do that. Oh, I don't have to have a 17 year degree to do it because I'm, I just have a high school diploma. It's okay. I'll teach you. It's all good. You don't have to. I mean, not to say I don't want him to go to college, but um, it's important for us to teach the, the young generations to know that you don't have to have all the things that they think they have to in order to be a part of it if you don't do it in front of camera. And on that note, um, I know Eva has to run, so. I have to go, but I wanna say I love you ladies. I love you so Ooh. much. Love you Thank too, you. It was so oh, great talking Eva. to you. Mil gracias por todo. And now I will turn it over to Sean Finney for our final questions. That was so amazing, so beautiful. Thank you all so much for coming and just sharing your light and your stories. Um, Yvette, I, I wanted to start with you just because you mentioned something about what I think is so important in the Latino community is that you are so many things, right? So a lot of everyone can be ethnically ambiguous. Um, do you often, and for all of you, do you feel misunderstood uh, because they may not understand Victoria, you're from Argentina, and, and Nadia, you're a New Yorkian, and Yvette, you're this. Do you often feel that completely misunderstood in the community as well as people not in the community? In the Latino community or in the industry? In the industry. Um, yeah, they're, it's per, they're perplexed. Um, um, they're, they don't know quite how, like what I am. I think that there's a lot, I mean, I, t I spoke about it a little bit earlier, but you know, our, our educational system, right? We are completely erased from our history and our contribution, so nobody understands the difference. And I didn't even know my own, my own history until I went out and bought a bunch of books on Puerto Rico, right? And then that's when I learned, like, and then I got my DNA and I could see the map. I'm like, oh, West Africa, North Africa, here I go. Like, I mean, it was just fascinating to me. That's not something I learned in a history book or in, you know, advanced learning. And then so we don't have, and I'm really excited about Fingers crossed the American Latino Museum on the Hill. That's gonna be a beautiful place where people can come and learn about our culture and our history. And um, in Hollywood, right? Hollywood has, Hollywood could help us get there quicker because everything else is gonna take a minute, but Hollywood has the power right now, right here to make a difference and to help us tell our stories so that people aren't afraid of us and they're not stereotyping us. So really it's, it's Hollywood that I'm talking to Hollywood. Like you have that this is not rocket science. It's really not. I think it's important not to dilute your story to blend in. And I think what we've been trying to do for so long 
is to blend in. Why? Because mm -hmm. it's better that way. If you blend in, they're not going to single you out. And, and you can't, you can't not blend in as a female. Uh, if that's how you define yourself, then, then you have to def just blend in in every other way. Right? You're, and you're going to have enough. You're going to be discriminated as a female. So just shut up. Don't sit. Just, you know, if you have an accent, work on it so people don't hear it. Uh, I refuse to work on my accent. It is what it is. Mm. Either you like it or you don't like it. I love it. Uh, and, and don't get me pissed off because I'll start rattling in Spanish and I'll just say it all. And that's just how it goes. Lorenza, no te rías. It's just how it goes. I mean, like, I, I so many times... People say, I love it when oh. you start singing in Spanish. I do. I just, I, you know, I, uh, I, people used to say to me, are you Italian? And it was all, that invite, you know, that sexy invite to say yes, yes, say yes, so that we can actually, con I'm like, well, my grandparents were, but no, I am full on Argentinian. And that was... <sighs> and uh, Victoria, do you remember when it was the Italians and the Irish? who are discriminated against. So that's the interesting thing. Now they're cool. Totally. totally. <laughs> it's, everything has a flow, but I think that the more of us that are out there talking about it, the more of our stories, the more that, the more times that Nadia gets to tell that story, that Puerto Rican or Euro Rican or New Rican, whatever, however you want to call it, Nadia. And maybe the, in your next film, you tell the other story uh, after Maria. Because those were three mothers. There were thousands, thousands that were affected. Um, and maybe is the one after the earthquake. Who knows? But you told a different story with Becoming. And, you, and it's always enriching the fact that behind that camera, there is a person that represents us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then we can talk about it. And the minute that people see it, that it happened to you and it happened to me, and Lorenza and Carmen and Yvette and Eva and many others. You don't have to be Penelope Cruz or Salma Hayek or Eva Longoria. There's other women out there that are doing it. And that's the most important thing. You can be um, in any other place in the film industry. And there's so many places that you can be to make a difference. Absolutely. And I do think to speak to your, Victoria, to your, um to what you were saying, like specificity. For me, it's been very exciting in these last, I think only really five years um, to see these voices telling their own stories, our own stories. And, and I think until there is real specificity to the narratives, it's, it is gonna be like, oh, here's a cast, you know, make this supporting person Latin or make her black. And I, I, even for me, who is all about, as I said, c correcting exclusion, I don't find that to be any kind of solution. I actually find that to be somewhat, I don't wanna say racist, but it's, you know, it, it, it doesn't solve any problems, but it makes people feel like something has happened. And I don't like participating in that. If there's a story reason for, the supporting character to be Latin or black, then fantastic. Or if you're going to change that story, if you're going to enrich that character in a way that is specific, then great. But when you get these, these storytellers telling their own stories, that doesn't have to happen because it's natural. It's natural to the story. It's, it's just like it is natural in our actual lives. Are you saying that you'd rather not have those supporting roles be of people of color because it's not necessarily that story that they're telling? I prefer if that, and this is something that I generally try to do, and I'm pretty successful with it in having a dialogue with the filmmakers and saying like, you know, great, yes, but is there something that makes this relevant? I also agree with, you know, trying to just make the entire thing more diverse and it doesn't have to be specific, but I'm saying for us to move forward, like just even just the little tweak of like, give that person a reason to have been Latin in, you know, at the JPL or whatever. Um, again, because I think it does speak to the specific. Yeah. I agree with you, um, Carmen, and actually we both, I worked on Vida on second season. I mean, you did an amazing job with Vida, but for me as a marketer, talking to our media and having to really, you know, talk to all the organizations and say, I do not want you to come out and start talking about the fact that this is a story about LGBTQ and that's East Los Angeles, like, 
I, I literally had to speak to them in advance to say, do not come out and just, this one story is a very specific story that was so beautifully told that it's not everybody's story, you know? And so, and, and the specificity of the, what you did with that specific um, show, I mean, I loved it. I love every character in that, in that series. They're amazing. Um, thank you. I think it is. I think about it's sister. about allowing ourselves to be our full selves. And in that one, it is. It's about being sisters. That story is That's about it. being sisters. That's it. It's universal. It's the fact that so they universal. And one is gay and the other one is not. And then the mother, yeah. it's, we're sisters. And I think the people love to pigeonhole us into the one thing. And I understand they have to sell it. And I understand they have to, um, in this moment in time, they have to sort of look good and saying, no, no, we're, we are inclusive. We are, you know, that's we're right. trying to correct exclusion, as Carmen says. Mm -hmm. and that's my favorite line of it all, the whole day today. I'm so glad that I heard it. But I think it's important that, can we just be women? Can we just be moms, sisters, partners, friends? And then the moment that we start taking the things that makes us so different, we start belonging and we we tell that to ourselves and we tell that to society is like we are if you look at every single netflix show that is here now from every country i've seen them all because i see everything from all over the world we're not that different we all have the same problems absolutely of course well, i mean we speak another language we may look a little different, but truly it's about the pursuit of happiness, the lack of friendship, the need to decide, the fear of dying. The, I mean, I can go on and on. It's universal. Absolutely. It's very much universal. And Netflix is such a great um, platform. I watch all of the same. I love it so much. I mean, I'm watching every country and I, and I always think to myself, Hollywood studios, why? Why can't you do this? Why can't you look at what Netflix is doing? It's amazing. I mean, it's it's right there for you just to understand that there is a um, an audience, a global audience. I think slowly but surely everyone is getting the um, they're they're hearing the bell, which has been ringing for a long time. Okay. Yeah. But you say something, Victoria, that I will never forget, and and that's like you're one until we're thirty percent of the room. You're, until we're thirty percent of the room, we're really not going to see a change, right? We don't change, we don't, right. we don't turn the room. I right. always say that you can be the 1% or the 2% or the 3%. The problem is 30% has enough weight to, right. start, to start changing the conversation. You, you still can be toppled by the other 70%. But when you're just one voice in a room uh, where there's 10 people, you're just one single voice. And then you're two, then you just that pair that is always... Meh, meh, meh. Then all of a sudden there's three people talking about it. So it's not just the rattlers, there's somebody else. And then somebody in the room, again, of 10, finds themselves to have permission to hear what you're saying. They allow themselves to hear it because more than one person says it. And then, then you, you turn to start to be heard. Because you may be being listened to, but if you're not heard, you're not gonna turn the room to where it needs to, or if nothing else, to be heard. Sometimes we just want you to consider it. Like Carmen yeah. is saying, consider not excluding us. Just consider it. Consider giving that character a backstory as opposed to Latin boy, 17. Mm -hmm. Just consider it. And that to me is part of why, not only are we talking about it in all these rooms, but people are listening and we're being heard, which is the next step to just, you know, listening for, because you politically have to do it. Yes, I think that's what's right. interesting uh, about the 30% the is that for me, that, that feels like it's going to take a long time because we have to have a pipeline, right? And these people have to have experience and we have to, we have to really build it. And that's hopefully what's happening. Okay. Don't get caught up on the pipeline. We built a studio without knowing nothing about how to do it. And that's how Marvel Studio was born. Please don't get caught up on the, we would have, no, just do it. Just do it, yeah. please. Do we, it. I mean, I think there. we are all doing it. I think everyone else has yes. to come and on board. That's the thing. They have to do it.
And I want to say that one thing that La Colab is doing is meeting with studios and they are looking, um, we, there's, there are a lot of Latinos that are qualified guys for these jobs, FYI. So I do believe in the pipeline and all that, but really there's a lot of us. And, um, and so what I'm, what I'm seeing is that a lot of them are open to, have, to having this conversation. We are collecting resumes and sending them their way. So there are a lot of Latinos that are ready. So, um, you know, I think it's important. And I had a conversation with the head of a studio that reached out that for me to possibly come inside and leave my company. And one of the things he, he wanted to sit with me and ask me why certain films didn't work. And when he brought up this film and I told him, his face dropped and he was shocked. He was absolutely shocked at, and why didn't anybody tell me that? And I said, because no one looked like me in the room. You know, and this is exactly what, if you don't, you're making decisions without us in the room. It's just, you're, you're leaving money on the table. It's really simple. It's not fiscally responsible, is it? No, it isn't. Yeah, it's, it's silly. Well, Mujeres, thank you so much. This has been so incredible. I know we could sit here and, and talk for hours and hours, and we have to do that at some point once COVID ends, right? We'll do it in person. I just want to thank you so much. What an amazing group of women. I'm so proud and I'm so happy that you're all here. Hi, I'm Carmen Kuba. Thank you for watching Academy Dialogue.